Hello, everybody. Today is March 28th. This is the KCB community meeting. Uh, we would like folks to use the raise hand feature if possible, so I'll do my best to moderate uh, while we're going through things. We do have an agenda issue in GitHub, which I will paste the link into chat. So if you would like to add anything to the agenda, please feel free to add a comment and we'll go through from top to bottom. But before doing that, uh, I am seeing some new faces, uh, at least new to me. So welcome and thanks for joining. If there is anybody who would like to introduce yourself, um, I'll pause now and, and give you folks a chance to do so. Uh, no obligation. So if you don't want to, you don't have to. But if you'd like to say hi and uh, give a you know 10 second intro, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, introduce a, a few folks from that I work with at Upbound uh, who are joining the call who are going to be um, getting a little more involved in KCP. Um, I think Jason, Bulat, and Ben are all here, so you are welcome to introduce yourselves. But uh, yeah, we're all excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks. Welcome. OK, uh, so I'm going to move on to the first item in the agenda here from Andy. So over to you, Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to know in general, I put a, a feeler out there for Paul a couple days ago and um, haven't really had any chance to synchronize, hook up with him on, on this. But I wanted to know in general if we have any caps in place or are planned and um, you know, what are the prioritized components of KCP that we, we think we see moving upstream? Just a general discussion, and if there's other important pressing matters, then obviously, you know, we can put this aside. But I thought maybe we have a general understanding of that on this call. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, so to date, as far as I can remember, the only two potential caps that we've discussed authoring are first a generic control plane library cap, and this would be a library that both Kubernetes and KCP would be based on upon a successful completion of implementing it. And it would be uh, generic enough that it's not specific to pods or stateful sets or any of the other um, workload related built in types. And the nice benefit for KCP is that it would reduce the amount of code that we have to carry in our cube fork when we're rebasing. It wouldn't eliminate it, but it would um, get rid of some of it. And then the second proposed cap is around logical clusters and making that a concept that the upstream uh, API server and API machinery and storage code would uh, accept and support. And so is that is that along the lines of uh, the TMC or the or namespaces? I'm sorry, workspaces specifically. It, it's not for TMC. It, it's just the technical foundations for logical clusters. Okay. So it would support workspaces in KCP, but we're not necessarily saying we we want to upstream workspaces. And uh, I see Paul just pasted a link. There is a logical cluster repository that SIG Luster Lifecycle has created. And uh, so that's the, the Kubernetes SIG's logical cluster repo. That repo is around um, accessing or referencing entities that live in different logical clusters where maybe uh, two logical clusters are actually two distinct physical clusters or two logical clusters are the way that we represent them in KCP. Uh, and that's to support, among other things, controller runtime. But from a CAP standpoint, uh, when, when I mentioned logical clusters and getting support in Kubernetes for those, that's about taking storage and in particular etcd and segmenting it so that or partitioning it so that you can have distinct logical clusters inside of one storage mechanism and having the support in the api server for it as well okay in terms of api bindings and exports um 
we haven't talked about trying to do a cap for those. Um, I think it would be cool if we did, but uh, I think we probably need to see what sort of appetite might exist for some of these concepts in some of the other SIGs beyond just API machinery, because things like logical clusters and API exports and bindings are, um, you know, they're, they're useful things that yeah. you might want to see in SIG multi-cluster or right. SIG apps, I, I don't know. So I, I think trying to find uh, supporters in some of the SIGs where they might, these features might be used would be a, a good, um, good thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That gives me some ideas there. Okay, cool. That's all. Uh, we, we haven't started writing any of these caps. Um, and I think it would be great if there's folks who are interested in co authoring uh, either the generic control plane one or the logical cluster one. At some point, some of us will start working on them, uh, but I don't have a timeline right now. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay, cool. Uh, so, Mike, you want a status update on the rebase to 126? Uh, I was on vacation last week, so didn't make any progress uh, beyond the little bit that I had done before. But yesterday, I was working on preparing a 126 branch with some backports for some of the PRs that we have in our um, cube fork right now based on 124. Once I have a 126 branch with a good set of backports, then I'm going to try and rebase on top of it. Thank you. OK, uh, Sergius, over to you. OK, thank you. OK, so um, I would like to present some progress on work that I have been doing in a tool called uh, Cubebind. Um, and I, I was a little unsure if this is the right community because we don't have a community call in Kubebind, but we have one in KCP, and both projects are very, um, so to say, um, you know, um, semantically um, similar. And uh, I, if you want, Andy, I can share my screen because um, sure. I, I, I to have a little bit of a guided um, introduction because not many um, or maybe not all of the listeners may know Kubebind. Um, but since this is a KCP community call, um, you may know the concept of API exports and API bindings in KCP. And um, essentially, the TLDR of Kubebind is take the same idea of API exports. You know, in Kubebind, they are called API service exports. And the concept of API bindings here, they are called API service bindings. Um, and instead of uh, using latest resource schemas in KCP to describe um, the concrete API that you are exposing, we are using good old CRDs in Kubebind. And the TLDR is instead of having KCP to be able to um, export and import uh, APIs, you can use your stock Kubernetes cluster. Um, that is, you have some provider um, that may be Kubernetes. And side note, there is uh, the KCP logo here uh, for a reason. Um, that is exporting APIs, you can bind to those um, APIs and import the CRDs inside your cluster. It's sort of like a consequent con continuation of the sort of like service, uh, software as a service-ish idea that we are pursuing in um, KCP. And as you see here, currently in Kubebind, we have Kubernetes as uh, a provider reference backend implementation. But we would love to also um, gradually introduce KCP as a provider API provider because you know KCP is very good at providing APIs. Hence, it makes um, sense to to use them in Kubebind such that you can consume APIs that are exported in KCP also in the Kubernetes clusters. However, we have to do a little bit of homework. And um, if you want to know more, by the way, this is a drawing made by Stefan, who is obviously also known here in the KCP community. If you want to know more about Kubebind, there is a very nice um, KubeCon talk by, by Stefan Schmeinski, uh, who is also on this uh, talk, who like goes a little bit more into detail on what Kubebind is all about. Uh, having said that, before we 
like attack and you know do all things um, and also add a KCP provider, we have to do a little bit more homework because the current um, you know uh, implementation of Kubebind also needs a little bit of massaging and love um, uh, when it comes to you know full usability in a in a, in a production like environment. And most notably, if you um, are used to KCP, the process of um, binding to APIs is pretty simple. And you just have to set up um, a couple of ORBEC rules. Um, and sometimes it's not that simple as Steve <laughs> found, out so previous, found out previously, but essentially you are scoped within one system. You are scoped within KCP and within the ORBEC boundaries of KCP. In the world of QBind, it's not that simple um, because on the left-hand side here, uh, where you bind APIs, is one Kubernetes cluster, and the right-hand side is another provider cluster. So they are like literally um, very many, you know, network boundaries um, uh, between those two worlds. And we currently, before you can bind any APIs, similar to what you have to do in KCP with Orbec bindings, we have to authorize ourselves uh, in front of the provider. Um, we, we have to, uh, you know, pick a couple of uh, APIs that we want to bind against, and there is a you know nice interactive flow that the user um, uh, can do uh, before the binding has ended. And this is sort of like the TLDR sequence diagram that is currently implemented. I will spare you the details and will not go through all the details, but there was one thing that was implemented in sort of like a um, you know initial uh, prototype-ish way, and that is if you invoke the QBind command line. Um, Interface that is, you know, a regular kubectl uh, plugin. It literally exposes a web server listening on local host, and it blocks until you, you know, executed all the necessary steps on the provider side. That is, you authenticated, you authorized, uh, you picked the APIs that you would like to import uh, into your cluster, and after all that machinery is done, literally the browser executes a callback, a 302 callback against local hosts such that it hits your blocking kubectl bind um, web server. Um, this is a nice initial you know, implementation. However, obviously it has one of the biggest drawbacks is that you, know, you cannot invoke the kubectl bind binary on, for instance, a remote machine via SSH because your um, local web browser cannot reach that machine and, and the callback would lead to nowhere. The other drawback is that we have to transfer a lot of metadata via this callback. There is literally a cube config uh, generated on the provider side um, and a lot of additional metadata that has to be squeezed as you know a request parameter um, back into this callback URL. And as you know, you know there are limitations in browsers. Um, we, we could go on. Uh, we would like to improve this, and you know, what, one step that we want to improve this is um, what I, you know, called uh, a poll-based uh, binding process. Um, and also, without going much more into detail, is we are obviously replacing um, a local host callback with state on the provider. So instead of um, blocking until um, you finalize the process, we are regularly polling the backend. Uh, are you done yet? Are you done yet? It's a very simple semantic. Um, and when the user finalized the whole API resource selection mechanism uh, and authenticated and authorized itself, the session is marked as done, so to say, and we get um, a success on the kubectl um, um, yeah, client side. Um, for those who are a little bit into OAuth, the one interesting concept that was introduced here as a, in, inside the proposal is the concept of a so-called credentialed client. Um, if anybody is following the OAuth 2.1 spec, there is a new type of client that I took inspiration from. Um, that is, you know, those clients are not public clients, they are not confidential clients, they are somewhere sitting in between, that is, the client is not registered a priori on the provider side because we want to be able that anyone binds to us. Um, but we have to make sure that you know if one client created a session in the first place, you know, not another client can just piggyback on that session. And that is you know done using a simple um, um, secret mechanism where ephemera secret is created on the provider side, and then all the requests towards the provider are edge make. Um, signed um, such that you know we can make sure that 
the requests are generating from the same client. Um, if you're interested in this kind of jazz, uh, please don't hesitate to um, review the PR that is on the Cubine side. Um, a thing that I'm proposing there is I created a doc subdirectory with a proposal subdirectory. I took inspiration a little bit from the Thanos project where I was also active in the past where I also created a proposal like this. Um, so what I'm just telling you here, um, you know, via audio is like a, a little bit in more detail described in this whole proposal here, including, you know, structs and stuff like this. So if you're interested, please take a look. Um, and again, this is the first step um, to sort of like make Kubebind fit um, for a real production case. And the other steps will be to have KCP at the back end and uh, also things like permission claims and other interesting bits. So um, stay tuned for further updates. Alec, you have a question? Yeah, um, maybe you're doing this already. I was curious if you considered for the Kubebind flow with the provider, like literally just using OAuth, OIDC. Yeah. The yes, reason I, I say that is because yes. if you did that, then you'd sort of have a kind of existing threat models and kind of by the book uh, protections you could use, state parameter, pixie, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah, I mean, we are not we are not outside of OAuth. We still have a regular OAuth flow, obviously, on the provider side. On the so provider all, side, yeah. Yes, but, exactly, yeah. right? Um, uh, like we have a little like I've been experimenting a lot of with the device flow that was introduced uh, by OAuth because the command line mm -hmm. um, kubectl binary uh, obviously is a thing that is or will be invoked on remote machines. So uh, like a semantic of right. a OAuth device flow makes kind of sense. But the device flow was sort of like a showstopper because the device flow will not enable us a user friendly way of picking resources in a uh, browser and have a guided um, selection mechanism. Um, you you have to uh, you have sort of like the um, device flow authorization, and then you have to do other steps on the command line bin binary to continue sort of like the process. Hence the idea to introduce this flow. Having said that, um, I'm more than interested if you have sort of like ideas or brainstorms if we can piggyback on the device flow to add you know other interactive um, UI mechanisms like API resource selection and make it a first class. That would be great, obviously. Mm. Because as you see, like there is stuff stolen from the OAuth stack uh, around the credential to find and ripping out the stuff that I don't need because authorization and authentication is already a soft problem. Yeah, it's more like, I mean, if you squint, OAuth is really a communication framework between three parties, yes. right? Yes, and getting precisely. the yeah, and it's particular privacy properties of those yes, different precisely. parties and trust properties. So yes. you can kind of use that creatively. That's sort of what I was getting at. But yeah, I'd have to think about it a bit more yeah, to be exactly. able to provide. That. You're, you're completely right. And I was very hesitant myself initially. So I just squeezed out that part that is interesting for us, namely sort of like the credentialed client semantics, which, by the way, is not part of the OAuth spec yet. It's going to be like in the successor 2.1. And that's exactly sort of like the thing that we um need here anyways enough of OAuth uh <laughs> authorization talks um that's the thing that i wanted to present again um don't hesitate to have a look at this uh, proposal and um and i'm also curious if you like the pro like process itself of submitting the proposal here and uh, once it is submitted it will be part of the docs subdirectory and you know we, we won't have the problem of you know submit having lack of, of documentation so to say that's it from my side. Any more questions? That was a good one. Thanks, Alec. Very cool. Thank you, Sergius. Um, yeah, if uh, folks have comments, please feel free to add them. And let me get my thingy shared again. Give me just a second. There we go. Uh, all right, Steve, you are up next with cross workspace identity and permissions. Yes, uh, this is not a fully hatched um, topic, but I just wanted to make a comment here and, and get feedback and thoughts from other people. Um, so I've been poking around recently in this uh, workspaces as a service concept, and we have I noticed we have a couple couple spots in the current code base where we do um, implicit things 
around permissions because we have one cross workspace permission that's to bind an API export. And I don't know that as a project, we've really considered whether or not we will have more cross workspace permissions. Um, perhaps David, actually, you, I don't know if there is one on the, do you need permissions to bind to a sync target? I don't know. Um, but w whenever you get into this cross workspace thing, a lot of other functionality we have starts to break down. So for instance, um, in workspace initialization, we impersonate the owner of the workspace in order to make sure that we can only initialize it to a state that you could have otherwise gotten yourself into. Same thing with uh, permission claims on API exports. You know, we had this bug many months ago where if you if you give somebody the permission to bind new exports in your workspace, we need to make sure that the ones that you're binding are only ones that you could have been bound, you know? Um, I think our approach here is pretty ad hoc, so I'd like to think a little bit more clearly about this. Um, if anyone has thoughts on cross workspace permissions that they'd like to see or, or systems that they were trying to build that require cross workspace permissions, I think that helps to answer some questions of how common is this type of pattern and whether or not we need this to be something that end users of the system are also configuring or if it's just a system specific thing. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, if you have you know comments here, hit me up async either one. I'd love to hear. Go ahead, Sergius. Yeah, generally I I totally agree, Steve. Um, I think we have at least two precedences now. The first one is the API binding use case, where um, we currently impersonate using a deep czar request, and um, there is this problem that we solved in the past where. Um, we need to somehow um, present ourselves in front of the workspace that is exposing an API export that is being claimed by another API export. So we have, ex uh, by another ex API export. So we have effectively two workspace hubs. And the user that is executing um, the actual binding is impersonated and is then anonymized in front of the workspace um, that is exposing a claimed API export, right? And that's that's sort of like like a, even like a multi-hop uh, use case. We have another um, use case of multi-cross workspace um, authorization and ORBAC that was presented recently as part of the, I believe, API lifecycle um, initiative where we have a very similar uh, topic and. I think, and I, you, you found out today also in our Slack thread, the current solution of impersonating via just an anonymous authenticated user in the workspace that exposes the you know, API export on the very end of the chain is sort of like a social solution because you have to grant any authenticated user the bind verb <laughs> on your API export such that they can be consumed uh, if anybody claims an API binding. And that is a very you know, broad permission that you have to give. So I would love to see that we progress on making a solution that you know, lets you narrow down the permission to uh, only those uh, users or service accounts that are really interested in the binding, right? Um, and also solve other use cases like the API life cycle problem. So uh, sorry that I diverged, but I just wanted to mention that this is quite a complex topic and I would like to have a unified solution if that's possible, yes. And maybe we need to start a doc or a discussion or an issue, something where we just list the different use cases that we currently support and maybe brainstorm if there's any other ones and if we need, and also including shortcomings and whatnot. And I see Steve has, what is this one example? So I think that's a that's the cross workspace permissions. That's the double hop that Sergius was talking about. But yeah, uh, I think yeah. we'll maybe uh, Sir, you and I can work on jotting this down, and we'll post it as a, a discussion probably or something. And I'd uh, love to hear other other. Um, yes, questions. there are there are even there is even a second documentation which I created uh, previously as well that, that specifically talks about API bindings. But yes, we can reference both docs, and I totally I think it's a great idea. And I think we should have a consolidated doc that references all the use cases that we have in mind and tries to come up with a 
consolid uh, consolidated solutions. Sounds good. Thanks for bringing it up, Steve. Uh, and do you have one other thing? Yeah, just yeah. Uh, just to make the call to action like clear. So, if you're listening in, and you're trying to build a system where either you have you have a cross workspace permission connection, so I give you rights to do something in my workspace, or if you're thinking about one of these systems where you delegate permissions to somebody else across the workspace boundary, those are the sorts of things we'd love to hear about. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, next up, Nolan, you added a, oops, wrong key, there we go. Uh, a call for feature requests for release 0.12. So uh, we do have this discussion uh, that is linked. And so if there's anything in particular that you uh, would like to see in the next release, please um, add comments here. If you look at the milestone, it purposefully only has one thing in it because um, we are currently working on that and we didn't want to just keep punting things from one milestone to the next. So we're trying to collect ideas and then we'll um, come back either async or in future meetings or both and uh, start to put things into the milestone. David, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was just um, about to mention the question of upsinkable up resources. Um, the So what was mentioned here was two weeks ago, I'm wondering whether it's still a, re, uh, a request to have that uh, in the next 0 to 12 uh, since it seems that the priority or the requirement for this has has decreased so maybe it's a question for paolo or andy or uh, can other, you uh, IBM can you write a reply here and see sure. yeah uh, I just asked, asked that question thanks sure. uh mike go ahead yeah i agree that's no longer a priority um, I also want to, you know, encourage people to remember. Hopefully, 0 0.12 is not the last release. Um, I'd like to be able to pick up work that's been done since 0 0.11 ASAP. Um, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't feel the need to wait for anything more than the rebase. Um, and even I could even make some use of works before the rebase. Okay, did you have uh, specific things that have gone into the main branch since 0 0.11 that you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, there was a bug we were stressing over around that time concerning um, logic cluster name versus path. And okay, I think there's yeah. some improvement there. Uh, okay, I mean, we can do another 0 0.11 if that would help. Yeah, that would help me, I think. Okay. All right, well, this is just a general call. Uh, if y'all have comments, please uh, add them to this discussion. And I don't see anything else for the agenda today. Anybody have any last minute topics you'd like to discuss? William. Yes, hi. Quick question. How do we work the awesome KCP repo? to get the PR to start documenting or pointing to different demos or repos that are using KCP? Uh, just need to review. I, I, I didn't realize you had had a PR until we talked earlier today. So <laughs> uh, I think I'm probably not following the repo and didn't get a notice or something. So yeah, we can just merge the PR and then um, continue to add more as new stuff comes up. Cool. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, give you all half an hour back. So good to see everybody. Thanks for uh, the new folks showing up. Paul, did you have a comment or were you trying to sign off? Yep. Wrong button. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Thanks uh, for joining everybody. See you next time. Thanks. Bye. Yep. Bye.